Well, welcome. I'm really hoping that we'll have uh, a few more people next week. I mean, I'm glad that we have the people that we have here today, but things are opening up, and uh, I encourage you, um, you know, don't keep staying at home just because it's streaming, and it's available, and then you've got your comfy chair there. Um, come back and worship with the rest of the church here and be a part of the community of the family of God in this place. Has anyone here been uh, in a courtroom? You ever, everybody been uh, called for jury duty? Anybody? Got a few people? Oh yeah, quite a few, eh? Uh, anybody been called for jury duty? Jury, huh? How do you say that? Jury duty four times? I'm the only one. Or maybe more. I don't know. Oh, 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 Clark, you've been tra- called four times uh, in your dreams, buddy. Yeah. He's a little guy, right? So he's never actually been called. Um, one of the things that happens there is, you know, if you've gone through the process at all, um, you recognize that there's a certain uh, need for the truth to come out, right? Uh, certainly in our society, you know, we can say, you know, I affirm that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In Canadian law, you don't have to swear on the Bible. It's not required that you swear on the Bible. You can affirm that what you say will be yes. If you say yes, it'll be yes. And if you say no, it'll be no. But it must be the truth. Not a partial truth. Not shades of the truth. But the honest truth. As Christians, as we've been started this a study in the armor of God, we recognize that we're in a battle, a spiritual battle. We just sang a song about stand up, stand up for Jesus. In that battle cry and that, that calling to us for us to put on the armor of God, it's like we need to be able to stand. And what is it that we're going to be standing against? Well, it's the schemes of the devil. It's the lies. It's the false. It's the part truth, but not the whole truth and nothing but the truth part. And so it's very important for us in this this kind of context and recognizing that the real enemy, the main driving force of the enemy is lies and deception, is that we actually know the truth. But then the question is, well, what is truth? You remember a guy saying that in Jesus' trial? Pilate, right? I'm just going to go ahead and read a little section there when Jesus is before Pilate. He's on trial and there seems to be this one-on-one questioning, this interrogation, because Pilate is trying to find out what the truth is here. He's trying to find out why Jesus is actually coming before him and the the Jews are trying to accuse him and have him be put to death. This is what it says in John chapter 18, beginning at verse 33. It says, Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness about the truth. Everyone who listens to the truth, everyone who is of the truth, listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate wants to know the truth. He's seeking to find out the real reason why the Jews are trying to put him to death. They say he's a king, but this seems a little suspicious. And so he's trying to sort through this. Of course, we recognize that the Jewish people, we know the back story. The Jewish people, the Jewish leaders... Um, they certainly, you know, they, they, it's not that it's not true <laughs> that Jesus is a king, but it's not the whole truth, right? The reason they're bringing him before Pilate is because he claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. 
And of course, being the Messiah, the Son of God, he would be a king who would reign on David's throne. And so they tell Pilate part of it. They tell him a part about the king part, because how can Pilate ignore that? A threat on Rome, another king. But it's not the whole truth. Jesus affirms that he's not a threat on the Rome. He says he's got a kingdom, but his kingdom is what? Not of this world. That doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect on this world, but it's not a kingdom like we might think of a worldly kingdom. If it had been a worldly kingdom, then, well, his disciples would have been fighting for him. But no, what happens? In the garden, Peter draws his sword and he cuts off the, the servant of the guard's ear. And what does Jesus say? Put your sword away. You know, this isn't the kind of battle that we're talking about here. This is not a physical battle that we're in. If, if my kingdom was of this world, well, then there'd be some physical fighting going on. But that's not what this is. That's not Jesus' kingdom. So Pilate says, so you're a king then? Jesus essentially says, well, yeah. I am a king. But let me define a little bit what it means for me to be a king. The reason I came into this world was to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who listens to my voice, those people, they're on the side of truth. That's my kingdom. Jesus is essentially saying, I'm the king of truth. He speaks the very words of God, Jesus does. He came into the world speaking only what God told him to speak. He speaks the very words of God. And not only does he speak the truth, the words of God, but he himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through, through him, through Jesus, right? Well, Pilate is unable to see this truth. Crazy, crazy enough, like, the truth is actually standing right in front of him, but he can't see it because his eyes are not open to the reality. He's looking for something else. He's looking for something in the wrong places. See, Satan's biggest weapon against you and I is the same. He wants to use deception on us. He wants us to be looking for truth. Even though we have the truth, he wants to say, I'm not sure if this is quite the truth or not. So we're looking around for the truth in all the wrong places. And so we might, he wants us to mockingly say, like Pilate, well, well what is truth anyways? Our society would claim to be an advocate for truth and justice, right? And, you know, in our Western society, especially in the American and the Canadian cultures, we would say that we're very much about justice and, and uh, you know, an a honest court system. And generally speaking, in comparison with other world nations, we might say that's somewhat true, that there's not so much corruption in the uh, judicial system. But our culture is actually looking for truth in the wrong places, isn't it? Is truth really based on political correctness? Is that where we find truth? As long as you stay politically correct. Is truth based on uh, the popular opinion at a particular time? Is truth something that is always changing and, and voted upon by a democratic society that claims freedom for all while believing that there are actually relative truths, different shades? We live in a culture that follows after many gods. Many of those gods would be things like materialism or, or um, you know, fame or whatever it is. And we also, where we live in our particular context, we live in a multicultural um, metropolitan where there are people from all kinds of religious backgrounds. And so there's different ideas of what is true. And so why is it so important that we know the truth? There are so many influences out there. And so what is true? Is, true, is truth actually a moving target? I think not. How can we know the truth if it's never known? Because it's always changing. See, truth, and Jesus says, you know, everybody who listens to my voice, they're the ones who are of truth. Truth gives us a firm foundation so that we can stand 
against the deceptive influences in our world. There's all kinds of ideas and opinions and lofty uh, ideals. And if you look at one time and you look 10 years later, all of a sudden the truth has changed according to society's view of truth. Can something that's true actually change? But apparently that's the way that we live. That's the culture that we live in. But we're people of the truth which doesn't change. And so we have this foundation. There's various views uh, of the function of the Roman uh, soldier's belt. So this whole, if you look at the whole passage in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, which we've started into, and we talked about, you know, that we need to stand firm, we need to put on the armor of God. And the first um, element, the first weaponry or, or um, armor that he talks about is this belt, call it the belt of truth. And so the Roman belt, what is it like? I, I don't know, many people have various ideas about this specifically, but one of the things that seems to be true for everybody is that, well, it firmly held everything in place. And so that you're able to move and you're able to, to function and, and to be in the battlefield without having to worry about things. Now, given that, that idea that it holds everything firmly in place, we might think about the idea that, well, probably the belt held the, the sword. It was a place where the sword was attached and it would not be, you know, be lying, flying around everywhere. It was, it was attached. The other thing that many will say is that probably the breastplate was actually secured by the belt as well. So you put the belt on and then the, the breastplate goes on and it gets it secured into the belt. And so everything is held firmly. Many of you know that I worked on construction for several years. So, and I was a carpenter. What do you think I thought about when I thought about belt? Anybody? A tool belt, maybe? Right? I mean, it, it, for me, it's like it's natural. So, I don't know if you've ever, like, I've done this because I've not been in the field anymore and I've gone to son, do something and I, it's like, I start to work on something and I grab this tool and I, and I, oh, I have to go over here and, and it's like, why don't I just put on the tool belt? Because what happens is if you put on your tool belt, then you're ready. Everything's right there, you're ready to act. And things can be done in an efficient way. Another thing that you might have noticed, you, you probably heard me talk about this a little bit too, that I, I, you know, I've, I, I joined a gym a few years ago, so I haven't been to the gym for a while, but maybe next, a week after next. Um, and one of the things that you see there is like a wide uh, you know, belt to support lifting heavy weight, right? And so Jesus claims that his words are truth. Uh, in the construction field, we might say it this way, that uh, you know, if we want to have a constructive life, one that builds up, then we need to have this belt on. Otherwise, what happens? Well, things are a little bit chaotic and they're not in, they're not in order. And also, we need to, if we really want to be strong in the Lord, if we want to be able to move those heavy weights, well, then we need to have the belt of truth wrapped around our waist. Jesus' words of truth enable us to stand against the lies, against the schemes. You know, at the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he said a lot of things, right? He's taught them a lot of things to the people. And what does he say at the end? You know the story? What does he say? Well, the, you know, there's all these things that you can listen to. The teachings of Jesus, we need to in, be in that truth. But the truth isn't really the truth unless what? Well, at the end of that Sermon on the Mount, what does he say? He says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. See, truth, that is, that found in listening to Jesus' words, it gives us a firm foundation so that we can stand against the deceptive schemes of the devil, against the influences around us that have all kinds of ideas about what truth might be, and it seems to be a moving target. But did you catch what Jesus said in that little story at the end of his teachings? What's the difference between the wise man and the foolish man? It's not that they didn't hear Jesus' words. 
The difference was whether they did it or not, whether they put it into practice. And if you go back and you look at that Sermon on the Mount, and you look at the way, things, the way that Jesus taught things, it was beyond just the outward doing. It was also about the inward motivation. You know, you've heard that it was said, you shouldn't, commit a, you shouldn't uh, murder, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother, it's, 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 more, it's, it's, it's practice, but it's not just the outward act. You've heard that it was said, you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who looks at a wooden lustfully has already done it in his heart. Like, so it's, it's something that's inside. This practicing isn't just like the outward things that you do. It's also the motivation of our heart. That if for those who listen to truth, it's not just about doing the acts on the outside, it's, what, it's the acts on the outside come because of what's inside here. Fastening uh, the belt of truth around us prepares us for doing. I, I, I mentioned the idea of a tool belt, putting it on, so now you're ready to start. And so it frees us for action. It moves us to love like Jesus. Jesus once said this statement to um, some of those who believed in him. He said this, he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We understand the concept of being free from slavery to sin, right? That the truth sets us free from love of money, from maybe drug addictions, from porn addiction, from unhealthy relationships, from jealousy, and a whole slew of other uh, sinful practices. Those things that only lead us to destruction, as it were, instead of construction, instead of building up. The truth can also set us free from false teachings from being tossed to and fro by the ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. But when the truth happens, with, when we have the truth within us, when we speak the truth in love to one another, instead of, what, instead of this destructiveness and this unknowingness, there's this knowing and there's this building up where we become stronger, we become more like Jesus Christ. Truth also sets us free from religious traditions that can impose unnecessary burdens on us. Sometimes those traditions have really good intentions and, and they can start off really well, but when those in traditions then become replacements for the commandments of God, well then we no longer have the truth. When it comes to our spiritual battles, not only does truth set us free from our past and from worldly influences around us today, but it also sets us free to be who God made us to be. What is it supposed to be like? If you're going to name one person that you're supposed to be like, what would you say? Please, please get it. Jesus Christ, right? We're set free not to do whatever we want. We're set free to be like Jesus. To love like Jesus. The uh, King James Version, instead of the word fast, and it uses an old English word, gird, and gird actually means to um, prepare for action. Truth is found in the words of Jesus, and so we ought to, uh, you know, know those words. We need to uh, hear his teachings so that we're ready for action. We need to listen to the prophets and the apostles of Jesus Christ who speak his words. But truth is not the accumulation of biblical facts. Say, well, I know my Bible really well, so therefore I must know the truth. Not necessarily. You know, it's not academic exercise and the accumulation of biblical facts that gives us truth. Truth moves beyond just facts to the practical, to the, the one who does, and not just does on the outside, but does from the inside, motivated from the heart. A heart that is like Jesus in his heart and his love for others. Did Jesus die on the cross just as an outward act because, you know, it's the right thing to do? Or did he do it because he loved you and I? One of Satan's biggest lies, things that he wants to try to 
convince you and I, even as Christians, as disciples of Christ, to do is that, you know, if you just accumulate a bunch of Bible knowledge, then, then, then you'll be, that, that makes you right. As long as you can quote all the scriptures, the deception is that, and that is it's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that, yeah, sure, we, we want to know the Word of God. We, of course, we should be uh, seeking to, to know what God has told us through Jesus Christ. We want to find out what His words say, but it's not just about what they say and knowing the facts. If that's all it is, that's not the truth. The truth is actually practiced as well. And it's full of love. Do you remember Jesus talking to his disciples in John chapter 15? And um, he uses this uh, analogy or this metaphor of being the vine and his disciples being the branches, right? And it's interesting as you read through that how everything sort of is intertwined. I'm going to go ahead and read just verses 5 through 10. And, and here, Jesus is using an example he's about the vine and the branches and how they're, they're need, the branches have to be in the vine, right? In order to produce fruit, the branches have to be in the vine. Listen to what it says. It says, verse 5, chapter 15 of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, some versions say, continually remains in, like, in other words, Jesus is our life. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and, th and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. See, we recognize that we ought to be like Jesus, that we ought to abide in Him. And Jesus says, well, abiding in Him means we abide in His words. But then if we're abiding in His words, then we're actually abiding in His love as well. If we're keeping His commandments, if we're keeping His words, then that's proven by the fact that we're loving that we're caring about others. And when this happens, then we live a life that is fruitful, that has meaning, that has purpose. This is truth. Truth is not just a bunch of facts. Truth is practice. And truth is practice in love. Fastening the belt of truth uh, around us prepares us for doing, it frees us for action, moves us to love like Jesus because we recognize that our standard for truth is, in fact, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is our banner, that standard that we, 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 we go into the battlefield for. It. He's that truth in that spiritual battle because Jesus is truth. We wrap ourselves up in Jesus. We make Him the, the very essence of our lives. You know, the next piece of armor that Paul talks about in the series as we go through uh, in the next half of verse 14 in chapter 6 of Ephesians is that the, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. But you know, we're not righteous in and of ourselves, are we? We're only righteous because we believe in the truth of God's Word. We believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And so for, therefore, he, His truth is abiding in us. And therefore, we're made righteous because we put our faith in that truth. Pilate was seeking the truth about Jesus. But he's unwilling to hear it. And at a loss, he abruptly ends the conversation with, well, what is truth? The irony was that, of course, while well, truth was standing right in front of him, he was face to face with the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus' voice. In your battle against the deceptive schemes of the devil, the influences of the world around us that have this, you know, ever moving truth standard. Listen to Jesus' words and practice them. 
The truth does set us free. It sets us free from the unknown, from this, you know, I, it, I'm not sure where things are going. There's instability in life. If you want to have stability, if everything's going to be firmly held in place, then we need to understand the truth. We need to listen to Jesus' words. We need to practice the things that Jesus practiced. We heard in our, our reading this morning for 1 John, uh, I didn't write it down. Um, it talks about the fact that, you know, somebody got a Bible, it's a physical Bible, and look at, at 1 John chapter uh, 2. 1 John chapter 2, let me see. Uh, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate for, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we know that we are in him if we keep his commandments. Commandments, something like that, right? There's this idea that commandments, the commandments of Christ Jesus, those aren't bad things. It's not like, oh, I have to do all these rules. No, what happens is if we are keeping the commandments of Jesus, then we're actually in love with Jesus. We're walking in the same way that Jesus walked. And how did Jesus walk? He did not walk in some sort of arrogant way. You know what can happen when people have the truth without love? It becomes arrogance. Like, we are right. You're wrong. That's not truth. Jesus Christ was not arrogant. Did he speak truth? Truth and his words were absolutely right, absolutely right. Yes, they were. And our words can be absolutely right too, but if they're just words that say that we're right and you're wrong, then they're not really the truth. Because the truth, as walking in the same way that Jesus walked, is one that is in humility and love for other people and cares about the world around us, no matter who they are or what they look like. And that's who we need to be. So I encourage you, fasten on that belt of truth. Know the words of God and practice them, but practice them in love because God loves you and He cared enough for you to send His Son who didn't just go through the acts because it was the right thing to do, but he did it because he loves you and I as well. And that's our message to the people around us, that they can be free. They can know the truth, and they can be free in Christ Jesus, free to live in a way that is the best way to live, a way of love. May you be blessed by God's word this morning.